Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, heartful and, and very dynamic introduction on, on ASEAN in particular. Um, very useful. Um, our session today is about cracking the code of M&A, which is a very interesting topic, but can be a little bit scary when you look at it from the outside. So let me provide a little bit more context on what we'll be covering today and the, and the key topics of discussion that we'll be covering uh, in the next hour or so. Um, I think ASEAN was mentioned in the introduction, and as ASEAN grows and integrates, M&A, mergers and acquisitions, are, are becoming increasingly a tool for international companies, ASEAN companies, but also <coughs> local companies in Thailand, Malaysia, or the different countries that constitute ASEAN. It's increasingly a tool for growth, whether it's to access new markets, access new capabilities, effectively grow or gain scale in a specific market. When you look at ASEAN as a whole, M&A has actually grown <coughs> quite significantly. So if, if you just peel out the numbers, you see that M&A has actually grown in ASEAN and has doubled over the past um, three or four years. So last year, more than $80 billion of M&A transactions were done across ASEAN. It's, it's starting to be a significant M&A market. And what we're seeing is an increasing number of companies, whether they're international, whether they're ASEAN or local companies, are using this as a tool to grow. M&A, however, is not necessarily easy. And um, you will read um, a lot of research that says that M&A very often fails, depending on the estimates. Um, you know, typically one third to half of M&A transactions are estimated to be successful. So M&A is not easy. So the topics that we'll be covering in this uh, in this panel today are really threefold. One, we'll try to understand and peel really what M&A is. M&A is a big word, but it really is constitu constitu constituted of different types of tools. It can be mergers, it can be acquisitions, it can be JVs, it can be partnerships. So understanding a little bit more what M&A is and building on the experience of the panel on what types of transactions they've been, they've been working on uh, will be one first topic. Second topic is trying to understand how M&A can effectively be a tool for growth what it means, what type of strategic rationales are typical for M&A, and what it's meant for our esteemed panelists. Three, we'll talk a little bit more about execution, what it takes to succeed. As I was mentioning earlier, M&A is not necessarily very easy to execute on. What does it take to succeed in terms of strategic intent, in terms of capabilities, in terms of organization, in terms of surrounding yourselves with the, right, uh, with the right partners or teams. So these will be the three key topics that we'll be covering today. Um, as we get started, we will um, first go through a panel discussion with our esteemed um, panelists, and, um, and then we'll, go, we'll open the floor uh, to, for Q&A as well, uh, towards the end of the panel as well. Today with me, we're lucky to have a fantastic panel. Fantastic, not only because of the depth of experience, I think I counted when I was reading the bios, I'm not gonna go through the bios, but there's probably 80 years of combined experience, which talks a lot about the, uh, uh, about the experience of, uh, of our panelists. But also we're lucky to have representation from very, very different types of organizations that have gone through very different m and types of journeys. We have international companies with G, um, um, uh, with, uh, in particular with GE, obviously, um, or Lenovo. But we also have more local companies. We also have ASEAN companies. So a great representation of different types of organizations that have gone through different types of <coughs> M&A journeys. So as we start, um, I would like to, to turn it to the panelists and maybe uh, start discussing a little bit and we'll st as we start discussing the, a little bit more the strategic lens of M&A. Strategic because M&A means a lot of things. And what would be useful for, uh, for the audience is probably for each of you in turn to start going a little bit with, uh, through your past experience. You've gone through very different types of M&A journeys. Your organizations have di very different <coughs> types of uh, uh, experiences. And it would be useful to, to go through that and, and take a different lens. Uh, I, I suggest that we maybe we start with you, uh, Kunjiriwood. And, and, and from an international <coughs> company perspective, it would be useful to see how Lenovo has used M&A in the types of transactions you've been right. using. Um, Lenovo is a uh, Chinese company. Uh, in the past 30 years, uh, it's called Legend. 
and during the 20, uh, uh, 20 uh, 2205, uh, I think a lot of Chinese company they feel frustration because a lot of U.S. company <coughs> and European companies they come to China and they are fighting with the local products or local vendors. So the M&A for Lenovo is starting from fear. It's not about the authority or it's not about the uh, business expansion. So the top management, uh, they discuss each other and they find a way to survive uh, during that period of time. And one of the solutions that they think is M&A uh, with the IBM PC division. <coughs> and in the first two years, I think uh, company facing a lot of uh, uh, loss and meaning that you know, M&A is not easy deal, uh, especially for the Chinese companies. Uh, they got no experience and they got no exposure uh, for M&A. And within the fourth year, uh, they come up with the strategy uh, we call protect and attack to define you know, the right territory, to define the right segment to survive after M&A. Mm, interesting. So a very international M&A strategy, effectively. Uh, maybe could you describe the types of transactions you've done? Obviously, um, Lenovo has been very active. There's obviously been sort of the historical merger between the US and the Chinese side. Been very active as well with NEC in terms of JVs. Can you describe a little bit okay. sort of the types of transactions right. you've, you've okay. done? Uh, <coughs> in 2009, uh, when the company came up with the protect and attack strategy, uh, where we can find and we analyze uh, where is the market for us, where we need to grow or where we need to protect the profit in order to subsidize or it's a pool, uh, profit pool for the company to grow the company. Then uh, we come up with a lot of JV and we started uh, JV with NEC uh, for PC division in Japan. Uh, this is the uh, forward integration uh, where we find that uh, Japan market is the big market. Uh, it's second to the China market in Asia <coughs> Pacific. And after that, we have uh, done a lot of uh, JV and M&A. Uh, 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 for example, uh, Median Company in Germany and then we have uh, another acquisition in the uh, Basel, which is a uh, CCE company. And then we have a lot of JV in US and, and uh, M&A for the uh, software products, uh, which is the uh, EMC uh, storage company. And then we have the stone, Stoneware, which is the software company. Most of M&A after the PC division from 2005, it's about the business expansion and it's about strategic uh, 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 target market. Uh, where the company need to grow in the global market. And a lot of the market, you know, if we just go and ex set up our new office and then we start up and learn the channel business and learn the market, it will take like years. So M&A will be the shortcut, Jamie will be the shortcut for the company to grow uh, in the short period of time. Thank you, very interesting. I'd like to stay on the international side. And, and maybe move to you, Kun Jirapan, on, on the G. G is, it needs no introduction, been very sure. obviously active in terms <laughs> of that. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, G is an infrastructure company. We provide um, gas turbine, jet engines, um, healthcare equipment, um, and of course the lighting that uh, <coughs> well known to, to everybody. Um, we are, our strategy is it's four folds. Number one is we, we are leading in the technology. Second one, we, uh, we leverage uh, our service and we're gonna go more on the analytics, as you know, the big data and, and, um, and industrial internet. Third one is about, um, we wanna capture the growth in the emerging market um, everywhere in, in, in the world. And last one is we should have effective um, <coughs> cost structure. With that, um, we, uh, we see the world uh, of three things. Number one is um, the world still need a lot of infrastructure you know, be it as uh, power plant, be it as um, locomotive, be it as, as healthcare. And, and we can see that with the, the growing economy, we're gonna have more middle class and middle class itself have a, a social media these days and ask the government to improve the infrastructure. So, you know, we see that it's a great opportunity for us to support that growth. And last but not least, with that infrastructure, they would need resources. Uh, they extract resources like oil and gas, and, and, and the rest, just to, um, to um, you know, help their economy grow. So GE is, is positioning ourselves, especially in ASEAN, to uh, capture that opportunity. Now, let's talk a little bit more on, on M&A. Um, 
GE in particular has been, you know, started with the, you know, with the technology like uh, light bulbs and, and, and other things. But along the way, there's another side of GE called GE Capital, started in 1933. And um, this, um, it was started just to finance uh, uh, appliance for GE. But over a period of, of almost um, probably <coughs> seven decades, um, it's growing through acquisitions. And um, from last I count, I, I don't know how many, but we probably have a few thousand acquisitions happen during that time. So, you know, during that time we learn, you know, acquisitions, what's worth, what not working, and we, we create our process internally, which I'm gonna share later in the execution phase. Um, so so that's, that's what GE is all about. And I'm fortunate enough, you know, at, that I joined GE in 2002 on the high time of consumer finance boom after economic crisis in 1997, <coughs> you know, in 2002. Um, that time, I was involved in um, you know, part portfolio um, acquisition, you know, some private level credit card that uh, you know, locally available, and we bought it and we improved it, and turned it to a dual card. And um, in 2006, I was uh, taking a role in, in Tokyo, uh, uh, Asian role, and that time we expanding um, consumer market in, in different places. Uh, you know, just to give a few names, a, a joint venture with Hyundai, um, uh, Joy Venture with Bank of Utia in Thailand, and uh, a few passive investors in Taiwan and 100% and, and uh, owned bank in Philippines. So that's sort of uh, my um, involvement in, in acquisitions and, um, and deal rationale and, and, and financial modeling that time. Then I came back to, uh, to Thailand, um, joined uh, Bank of Utia as a segment to Bank of Utia to help with the integration process and um, drive the bank uh, to, to transform to, to a next stage. And as you know, at the end of last year, we, uh, we divested uh, the shareholder to, uh, to BTMU Group from Japan. Um, prior to GE, I was uh, working in the uh, 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 Chapter 11 company and, and doing restructuring. Um, so that's sort of my MA background that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very useful too. And uh, very impressed by the thousands of acquisitions <laughs> that, uh, that obviously the group has gone through uh, over the years and, and tremendous learning. We'll obviously talk about that a little bit more during the, uh, the panel. Let me, let me turn to you, maybe Kun Porn Chai. Um, we've started with international companies. Sinya MB is the epitome of an ASEAN company uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, and obviously lots of adver advertising around this, but yep. the around very strong operations <coughs> across the region, some expansion through M&A as well. Mm. Um, I'd love to have your points of view, your point of view in terms of experience from a CIMB perspective, <coughs> but also as a professional. Mm. In your in your daily job, you obviously sort of um, have a very strong role in terms of transactions. It would be great to, to hear. Okay, thank you. Um, there are probably two slides to um, uh, I'd like to share. Um, I think we as as CIMB uh, with a strong DNA of ASEAN. We, we ourselves have been through a number of um, M&As ourselves. Um, in the past 10 years, uh, we've been acquiring um, uh, probably more than 12 securities houses plus banks, um, CMB Thai obviously included. Um, we also <laughs> are right in the middle of one M&A ourselves. Uh, we are uh, merging with uh, potentially two other institutions in Malaysia. Um, RHB and uh, Malaysian Building Society. Um, the second, the second side of the um, story is how we work with our clients um, <coughs> on the investment banking side to help advise them on, on M and A. Um, and you'd be surprised that um, a lot of times we had advised our clients to not go through with the M and A for certain reasons, because it usually costs money. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll go back to the, uh, the international side of the, um, our own M&A first. It's probably always start with the first question of why you want to do it. Um, it needs and must make sense economic, economically. Um, if it doesn't, and you think you're going to go in and turn around uh, within the next three years, you usually would end up spending the next five years sorting out issues. Um, being local issues, being people issues, being um, balance sheet issues. So be clear about the benefits that you want to extract out of your own M&A. Um, it always has to be 
the right question that had to be asked, and you should get the right answer first before going through or make a decision whether or not to go through with certain m and um, In majority of my experience, I've seen more failure than success. Um, and failure usually costs money, uh, a lot of money. Now, um, for our own M&A, um, it gives us usually the, the platform and access to market. As you know, banking is highly regulated, so high barriers in each country. So you can't just go in and, and buy a bank license. Um, uh, you need to be sure about what you want. Uh, you need to, to know what you're getting yourself into. For Thailand in particular, CMB had, had acquired uh, what formerly was called Bank Thai uh, about five years ago. We did that because um, Thailand is vital to, to being part of ASEAN, obviously. Uh, our DNA is ASEAN. Um, so far, in the past four years, we had spent some time um, sorting out issues. Um, issues that sometimes we are in control and sometimes we are not. The one that you cannot control are usually the most painful ones. Um, the way you work with, with regulators, um, with the industry peers are also very very important. Um, you need to change perception of how, how they view your brand. Um, it's also important how, how people see you as, as a player, um, as a member of their community. Because the key to operating in, in, in foreign market is to have local knowledge um, and the local people. We had been also doing uh, more M&A ourselves, um, not just buying banks, sometimes we buy investment bank franchise. Um, about two and a half years ago, we, um, we had acquired the uh, Asia Pacific investment bank business of RBS. And we did that because um, it's important that we expand our capabilities to cover not only just ASEAN, um, but to also the rest of Asia Pacific. It gives us access to not only local talent, but international talents. And to be clear, um, these are people with, with uh, sectoral experiences. Um, they have, they have um, very strong knowledge, um, very strong insight of each of the, of the sector that they cover. For example, we, with the IBS acquisition, um, we had acquired people who are uh, specializes um, uh, in either hospitality, uh, consumer, energy resources, media, uh, telecoms. These are people that could work with the, the local team in each of the countries that we operate in to give good advice to our clients. Um, it's always important. Um, uh, when we do business to give good client, uh, to give good advice to our clients. We, when we do advice on M&A, on the investment banking side, um, we spend more time telling clients or convincing clients to not go through with it. Mm. Um, and, and we would always start with the question saying, um, what would be issues in growing organically? Um, can you afford it? Um, can you afford? Can you afford people? I mean, more so than than than, than not. Um, Thai companies uh, don't have resources that would be willing to go either offshore or outside of Thailand. Um, and how would you operate? Um, where would you get resources? How would you integrate? And those are the questions that need to be asked. I'll, I'll, I'll end right here for the time being. Thank you. Very useful. So we, we're clearly in very different situations of very international companies sort of accessing markets. Obviously, much of an ASEAN view, uh, like what you're saying around expansion, getting access to markets as well uh, within an ASEAN context. Maybe moving on to, to you, uh, Nadim. Um, you have lots of experience of various transactions, but with a local entity, with a Thai entity, uh, you've undergone um, different changes in ownership with different types of owners. Would you, would you mind sort of covering that? Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not part of a giant companies as uh, these gentlemen next to us. We are a medium-sized company, and uh, we went through a uh, very interesting, we have a very interesting story. Uh, we went through three different ownership, and I was personally involved into you know, acquisition and merger, two of them as a <clears throat> on the selling side, one of them uh, recently and on the buying side. And it's been very um, uh, rewarding every time. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> the first one is because uh, the ownership of this company that uh, we, are, uh, we are running at the moment, uh, they had uh, very bad uh, financial uh, issues. And it was right after the ASEAN uh, economic crisis where they got hurt very badly. <clears throat> and the company was not able to get out of the problem. So eventually when I came on board and uh, I did, um, I, I recommended to the owner, uh, which the bank do not, I recommended the owner that we need to bring a partner to come and, uh, and uh, acquire us. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive. And we can maintain, I mean, you know, there are different acquisition where you can ma maintain a certain ownership uh, in the acquisition, in that particular acquisition. And we were very fortunate because we partner with a private equity company, very strong, very open-minded. And uh, at that time, we maintain 30% ownership. And the private equity, of course, they wanted to have uh, control of the company. But what is most important for them as well is to maintain the management. Because when we came on board, there was a new management, and we were able to turn around the company, the problems. But we didn't have enough funds to develop further. We were stuck. There was no fund to develop further the company. So uh, it, it was a very difficult situation. So this acquisition was uh, quite successful. And like every private equity uh, company, they exit usually after five to seven years. And they did the exit on the fifth year, a uh, very successful exit. <coughs> they were able to. Um, um, the, in the exit, they had a, a profit of two and a half times the, uh, the amount of money they purchased uh, the company. And uh, this present company, which is uh, SST, Subsea Thai, which is a, a listed company uh, on the stock exchange of Thailand, um, they were looking strategically at their portfolio. And SST originally is a warehousing company. They have a document warehousing. Very boring business but very consistent, uh, you know, EBITDA 60%, growth is small, but uh, they needed strategically to grow and to develop the business. So they decided to get into the food business. Our company, we manage food, uh, food businesses. <clears throat> and they bought our company uh, uh, in order to develop. Now, what happened to their stock value from eight baht jump up to 20 baht from in, in about a week time after they, they, they acquired uh, the food company. And uh, it's been quite successful the last three years. Recently, we acquired a very successful uh, restaurant chain, uh, a local restaurant chain called Greyhound uh, in Thailand that have, uh, uh, in, in locally, they have in Hong Kong franchises, in, in China franchises. We saw the opportunity here to grow even more. Because why? Because we have a very strong platform. The management team is very strong. Most of the brands that we have at the moment are franchised. We don't, have, we don't own our own brand. And in order for us to grow strong in the future, we need to have our own brand. So we decided to acquire the Greyhound brand. And it was a, it was a fierce battle because it's a very successful uh, brand in the market. And uh, some, <coughs> some um, uh, analysts, they say that we pay too much for it. But I view it, uh, I, I say to the analyst, you have no vision if you say we, have, we pay too much for it. Because this is a brand that's going to grow. This is a brand that has a lot of potential. It's, uh, it's positive EBITDA. It has a lot of potential to the international market. And it's, it has a lot of creative, creativity in what they do. And, and you know, like every great brand uh, uh, around the world, uh, once the awareness is strong, there is no limit to the... Uh, extension that you can do to the brand. Like, you know, why international brand can do it and not a Thai brand can do it. So I, 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 Greyhound can, in the future, you can have a, a Greyhound hotel, you can have a, a Greyhound coffee, you can have a Greyhound whatever it is because the brand is strong. So we saw this great opportunity, we went for it, uh, we got it, and uh, the company keep growing every day. Mm. Thank you. Very interesting. There are really three themes that come across and that I'd love to get the panel's view on. 
Uh, a first theme is around strategic intent and being very clear on the strategic intent. I think uh, Kun Pornchai, you, you mentioned that, and I think Nadim, you're mentioning that as well as you, as you think about it. So there's a first theme that I'd like to cover with the, the panel, which is how do you think makes a successful acquisition from a strategic standpoint? Not so much at the execution level, but at a strategic standpoint. There's, there's, that's the first question that I'll ask. The second question is around frequency of acquisitions. Well, I'm actually struck by a few things which is being mentioned in this panel, which is how you learn throughout the process. Doing a first acquisition, you may get it wrong, but then you learn throughout the process of sort of, and you hone as an organization your ability to actually deliver and be more strategically prone to find the right acquisitions. So there's a, there's a question on frequency acquisitions I'd love to get your, uh, uh, your, your view on. And then this third topic, which is a little bit softer, but it's around ASEAN, and it probably goes back in the, while we're here around ASEAN, which are, there are a certain th number of things around um, what it takes to succeed in ASEAN with lots of different cultures. Obviously, um, you know, it might be a Malaysian company expanding to Thailand, might be a Thai company even expanding within Thailand, uh, but there seems to be sort of a number of themes around uh, more of the culture aspect and how difficult and how it influences the, uh, um, the M&A process. So maybe, maybe we start with strategic intent. I'd love to, maybe we can start with you, Kun uh, you touched on that. What makes for a the right acquisition from a strategic standpoint? How would you think of that? And how do you think of it in the context of CIMB? Um, okay. I think I mentioned earlier, probably the first thing always is the, um, the clarity of what you want to extract out of the acquisition. And we use the word M&A a lot. We use acquisition a lot. Sometimes it may not be acquisition. Sometimes it could start off with a JV, um, uh, with somebody, with a, maybe a clear path for you to become um, a, a, a controlling party. Um, sometimes is to go into any other country with minority stake first, because um, you may not like what you see once you operate. Uh, in certain jurisdiction. Um, everyone talked about Indonesia um, because it's, you know, it's, it's got lots of people. It's, it's, uh, it's a market of, of over 250 million people. So if you think you can go in and buy something or go in and buy a distribution network, then you will be successful. It's not, that's not always the case. Because first of all, um, you cannot operate in any market without local knowledge. Um, and to find the right local knowledge, that's not always easy. So that's, that's, that's probably the first part of my question. Um, what makes M&A more successful is focus. Um, you have to have focus. It is something that you really have to want to do it. If you want to do it, then you, you ask yourself, as I mentioned, can you afford it? Mm. Um, and the first real question to ask is, can you afford for it to fail? Um, what would that do to you? Um, uh, do you have the right resources uh, to go through and work through all these potential issues? Because trust me, the, the easiest part is when you announce the M&A. Uh, the hardest part is, is, is to go on and implement it. Because the strat from a strategic viewpoint, you're always going to want to extract EBITDA or the synergies out of what you do. Um, it may turn out to be some things that you don't want to do also that you need to think about. So this thing has to be clear right from the beginning. Mm. Okay. You, you, you mentioned the word focus, and maybe I'd love to have uh, Kun Jeropan's reaction to this. G is very large, very yeah. complex. The organization that you work in, GGO, is, is partially sort of tasked with providing the strategic focus. How, how does, what is G's take in a way and your take on, on, on that word focus and especially in the light of how you assess M&A? Yeah, um, I think first of all, you know, the company look at acquisition as um, things that we can drive the growth. And of course, you know, if, if we look at the way GE look at the deals, we, we have a monthly process, fund out the deals. Believe it or not, we have pipeline of deals that queue up and then a few of them just get into the board and get approved and, and go through the process. Now, 
here's a few area that I like to share with you uh, aside from strategic fits, synergy, and, uh, and, and how we extract the value from a quiet company. Um, what we're looking in the target um, company for GE is number one is do they have a technology that we're looking for? Do they have intellectual property that we can take in and then, and then leverage that? Second one is do they have a product offering um, that we don't have in our portfolio? For example, um, you know, our, our oil and gas, we want to grow in oil and gas space, certain products that, that kind of you know, fit in our portfolio, we, we want to have that. We're looking also the the company that have a, a service potential, meaning they 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 can you know we can grow them to have more service stream income, and we're also looking for uh, the company that that give us the the go to market and, and customer connections, and um, also a potential to localization our production, and also the last one is you know that that growth potential. So when we see the the target, so what are we bringing to the target? Number one is we believe we have technology capability to, uh, to drive that, uh, to help them grow. Second one is um, we believe in our distribution and global presence, so bring that target company leverage the GE scale, um, and also the supply chain and, and the operational excellence that we have. And, um, and we believe that um, we also have a strong balance sheet and financing capability to, to you know, drive the growth of that acquired uh, company, and last but not least, uh, our brand name that, that can attach to uh, the acquired product and, and, and be able to sell. Mm. Thank you for that. M maybe Nadim, could you comment on, on your, you mentioned something interesting, which is price isn't everything. Some of our research at, at Bain actually shows that, which is there's actually no correlation between typical P multiple that you will be paying for, uh, for transactions as a whole and the return that will be achieved in, in the, uh, it all comes in, in the transaction, it actually all comes down to ultimately what happens after the transaction and the value that you can extract after exactly. this. Exactly. And so we'd love to hear your view on how you've been thinking through that, uh, of that sort of during the transactions that you've been involved in. And then on the second point as well, on the frequency and what you've learned in the frequency of, of acquisitions or, or transactions and what you've learned along the way by doing multiple, by multiple transactions. Right. Uh, I think the ultimate objective here, you, you, you sit down and here you have a, a mid-range, uh, we have a middle-sized company and, and we need to grow. We have issues, we have challenges uh, because um, as we start, w w when, when we first were acquired, we only had two brands. And these two brands are, are franchised. And one is Dunkin' Donuts, the other one is Au Bon Pain. And <clears throat> these brands have gone through difficulties, like I mentioned earlier. And so you got the perception in the market and the perception from the landlords that these brands are in trouble. And you know, it takes time, even though you do a turnaround financially, it takes time to, to build again the, uh, the respect and the confidence of the market towards the brand and from the landlord as well when you want to go and open stores. So we did an acquisition of a third brand, which was uh, Baskin Robbins. And now we are thinking here, we said, well, look, it's not enough because we're having these issues, these challenges in the market. Uh, one, we want to increase the value of, the, of our portfolio. We want to increase the value of our stakeholders. Um, we want to become a franchisor. We are a franchisee, we want to become franchisor, so we need to have uh, 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 this brand. When we found out that Greyhound was for sale, we said, well, this is the, this is the answer to our, solution, to our problems because this is going to build the respect that we are looking for and it's going to improve our portfolio in the market. And landlords are going to want to talk to us more. When you have, once you have a, a good brand in your portfolio, a lot of people want to talk to you about this. So besides that, of course, this is a brand that has a lot of innovation, so we can use their people, and especially the founder, because when, when we bought the brand, uh, we bought it partly cash, and we offered the founder equity in the, in the group, because we want to keep this innovation. Innovation is the future. Innovation is what it is all about, about the future, and we need to have this, this brain, uh, this person, this innovation that comes and help us overall. Uh, so that was part of the uh, objective as well. And of course, greater synergy with when it comes to, you know, like uh, logistic, HR, purchasing, you use this as a synergy. So when we got the brand, in fact, 
you had landlords who never spoke to us for two years start calling us and said, hi, hey, we want to come and see you. And that was great because like, where have you been for the last two, three years? You don't want to talk to us. But now that we have a great brand, you want to talk to us. So that's fine. And that's eventually our, our, our objective is being achieved here. Our stakeholders are happy. Our stock uh, uh, is growing, is getting, you know, the value is coming up because they see the potential. The platform is strong. So we are, we are opening up the future of the company for additional brands in the future. Mm. Thank you for that. Interesting. Maybe, maybe you could jero, jero it on the, on the Lenovo side. Um, one of the two, uh, maybe two, two questions, which is one of the more strategic level, a lot of the things that Lenovo is doing from a M&A perspective is around integration. Mm -hmm. So controlling the value chain in a better way to extract value. It goes back to, I think, Nadim's point, which is there are hidden assets in M&A which goes way beyond what the value of the company that you're, that you're buying or, or partnering with is bringing. We'd love to ha have your views on that from a Lenovo standpoint. And then the second question relates to a little bit more the cultural aspect of things. Yeah. Lenovo is, I think, probably the best example I can think of of a company that has expanded through M&As, JVs in multiple countries with very, very different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to understand how that's been possible and what, what ultimately were the ingredients of that success. Okay. Um, in <coughs> In the past um, uh, four or five years ago, uh, after we did live and come up with the uh, surgical protect and attack, uh, this is the uh, normal practice that we have to define the operating, define the market trend, and assess ourselves uh, where uh, our strength is, and then how to close the gap in, in case that we want to grow in the new area. So this is like normal practice for the company. <coughs> Uh, in every uh, lab office, legion, and the global uh, or head office, uh, they have to come up with the protect and attack strategy uh, in every single business unit and uh, country and okay. legion. So it's become our uh, blood, you know, it uh, becomes our practice, you know. We have to define the opportunity every year. So every uh, end of the, the year or Q4, uh, we have to come up with a plan and we have to define, you know, where we can go. Uh, if we can grow, what kind of investment do we need to do, and how much it costs, and where we get the source of fund. So this is uh, country practice, and become the regional office and the global market office uh, practice. So uh, the company uh, learn a lot of practice in M&A and JV. And if you look at the past history, you see that Lenovo. Uh, go and acquire some company and then uh, we do JV. And then we acquire some company and do JV uh, with different purpose and different uh, period of time. So some of the JV will be the uh, forward integration, meaning uh, we get the additional market, we get the additional channel. And some of the JV is going to be the uh, backward integration, meaning we got supply chain, we got the new products, we got new technologies. And recently, we even come with the, uh, uh, the new department uh, to find the JV uh, from the uh, local vendors, meaning, th meaning that everyone got the new products, so you can join us. Then we use or utilize our channel uh, to grow business uh, with the new, uh, win uh, new uh, JV. Okay? And in terms of the uh, culture mix and uh, execution, uh, wh where we find the difficulty, uh, you won't believe. Uh, <laughs> you know, Lenovo is the first. Chinese company that they use the local management team to run the business, uh, which is different from other Chinese company. Like you, you can see a lot of uh, uh, China Chinese company that they go globally. You know they still use the Chinese people to run the business. But Lenovo is the only uh, one Chinese company that we do different way. Uh, you can can you imagine? You know they send the uh, uh, people like uh, Chinese to run the business in Russia. They, they don't speak English, they don't speak Chinese, you know. So this is quite difficult uh, for the, uh, for the uh, head office, you know, to learn the business and monitor, you know, how well they, they perform. So uh, even in our uh, uh, management team, uh, we got seven uh, nationalities among 10 uh, management uh, uh, team. And Lenovo is quite open, you know, for, for the uh, uh, people in Galway, you know, 
to join with the uh, the, the company, and um, most of the uh, legion office, you know, we use uh, a lot of people from everywhere uh, to run the business. Uh, we got three head office uh, in uh, U.S. Uh, North Carolina. Uh, we got office in the Paris uh, in France, and then we got the head office in China. So we run three different uh, head office, uh, which is uh, quite new, you know, for for the uh, the Chinese company. Of course. Yeah. On the cultural side, <coughs> I think it's uh, as far as culture, culture, especially in ASEAN. You know, I've I've lived in Thailand for the last nearly forty years, so uh, I, I I truly understand the the culture issue here. But it's it's there is a similarity in ASEAN, and the, the cultural uh, aspect of an acquisition is so important, especially in uh, in Asia, because you got you got the integration where you have the, the people of that company, and you got to try to understand, uh, part of the success is very much the integration and understanding the culture of the present company that you want to acquire. Uh, because you don't want everybody to leave the next day. You know, usually people become very intimidated. I mean, the staff, they become very inti intimidated in, a, in an acquisition. They get very worried, and they say, well, these guys are coming in, they're gonna make changes, I'm gonna lose my job. Oh my God, oh my God, you know? So uh, you, you got to understand first the culture of that company itself. If, there, if, if you believe that your culture, you, you can really fix it up and, and work around it and get these guys excited to work for you, then, you're, then it's great because you're not going to lose all these people. They're, gonna, they're not going to walk out on you. And especially like packages and the, what they pay and, the, and all this. I mean, there's a lot of work. Part of the acquisition, my recommendation is like get an HR involved because it's so important to understand what the people are doing in that company, how, they are, how much they are paying them, the benefits, allowances. On the other side, you have the seller's culture and the ASEAN. I mean, just, I, I was 40 years in Thailand and I'm still learning, right? You, you never stop learning. Uh, uh, people from Indonesia are calling and they are interested. Hey, can we have a, a Greyhound franchise? We love the brand, da 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 da. So I said, this is great, very big group. I, sent them, I just sent them an email and I said, part of the process is to really check, you know, if you have good um, contact with landlords, if your finances are, are healthy, this and that. The answer was very negative. How can you ask us if we have the connection or if we have money? Do you know who you're talking to? You know, so that was like, it was an insult now. So I, I turned this, this uh, conversation into an insult. And especially in an acquisition, usually the seller or the owner of the seller doesn't want to lose face. In the, in the, in the market, he will look bad. Hey, he sold out, so maybe he must be doing really bad. So he wants to maintain, the, 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 the seller wants to maintain some sort of equity or, or, you know, to maintain the face or to maintain that I'm still here. I'm helping these guys. Yes, they came in, but I still have to be here and help them. So make him feel good because he still has a lot of, uh, re he's, he's got good relationship in the market. So that's, that's all part of the, you know, the cultural aspect of doing an acquisition or selling. Or, uh, mm. we, we, and, and in an ASEAN context, it's actually then it becomes specific yes. country by country. Absolutely, I mean, obviously yeah. a Thai example is, is going to be very different from an yes. Indonesian example, from a Vietnamese example and so yes. forth, which makes it sort of tricky to... Yes. Uh, because um, we made it, when we fit the first acquisition, the private equity group was very smart. They kept a very low profile. They made everybody believe in the market that the, the person that got acquired still owns the company. Mm, they, still, they, they kept a very low profile in the background. Mm. And they said, well, you as the CEO, you just do a lot of PR and activities and interviews, so you know, you, you're building the company. Interesting. What, what is G's approach to this? And you know, as we move more a little bit more towards execution, uh, as you mentioned, GE has done thousands of acquisitions and is renowned to have a relatively a strong process and a very sustained process to actually assess acquisitions. How does GE plan for integration? Are there tools that are being used? Yeah. First, I, I just continue on, on the cultural aspect, right? Mm. The uh, our cha Vice Chairman John Rice, when, when we asked this question, you know, him a question on, what keeps you awake at night? He said, you know, I, I'm worried that I won't have enough local talent in each country. So that's resonate to me that, 
you know, even we do a lot of acquisitions, we still need a lot of talent. So that's also leading to why we need a good integration process in GE. And um, let me give you probably two things that I, I kind of prepared to share with you, and maybe you can take some and, and, and that, that applicable to you and then rest, leave the rest. First of all, I'd, I'd like to give you a framework that we, what we work in GE when we, we think about integration. And then second of all, talk about you know, a few key takeaways and best practices that, that we learn over years and years and years, right? So the framework being like this, Let, let's think about the timeline. The day before you close the deal, we call it you know, during due diligence period. And then the second phase, we call the first 100 days. And the rest is from the deal close to, to um, 720 uh, 20 days or, or two years. So different phases, we, we, we can have different approach. So in the first phase in due diligence, you know, two things happen. Deals guy will hand out to the integration um, leaders and said, here's what we, we put on the plan. Um, here's what we think about synergy we can make, things that we're going we're gonna to do, hand off to, to the integration leader. And at the same time, the key here is you need to have the integration team since due diligence. Think about what are we going to do about people, what, what are we going to do about the channels, what are we going to do, et cetera, et cetera. Plan ahead. You know, we, we know that we cannot do integration before that, but before the deal close, but I think we, we need to integrate, um, integrate them since the beginning. So that's the key. Then once the deal is done, make sure that you have the day one plan, meaning once you announce the deal close, you, you need to have a clear actions on communication. You need to have a clear action on um, how we're going to deal with the, uh, the external uh, vendors, what sort of message you want to give an employee. And if you have to let go of people, say it on the day one. A lot of company I see fail is um, they just feel, you know, they want to save face of the acquired company and then drag it on and then put them aside on, on certain positions and become a, I mean, for lack of a better word, become a rotten apples and then it become a hindrance on your, on your integration. So be very clear on day one what you want to do and make sure that employee um, understand that. But you have to also give them a respect on uh, treat them with dignity, number one, for people who have to let go. And people who stay in the job, Try to uh, steer them toward on focus on the futures. Here we have futures together. And then on this first 90 or 100 days here, you need to have a mutual um, sort of uh, discovery or mutual meeting where the acquired or GE, uh, the acquiring or GE, and then the acquired company, uh, the target company, form a team together and work out on you know, what value crea creation that you, you can you can do um, you know, as a combined company and look at the due diligence on here's what the deal objective is and form sort of a strategy, um, integration strategy on here's value creation we can have and, and look at it as, as, um, as, you know, as a 100 day plan and communicate to staff. Don't forget about communication, communication. Make sure the, com you know, the, the new employees understand what the management trying to do. And at the same time, you have to, uh, to assess your risk um, on each of the, the things that you think that it might fail. So list it down and, and find the mitigations. So that, that, um, on that, that first 100, 100 days, once you get that, you, you get a sense of employee, yeah, two management come together as one voice. And then um, the acquired company will feel better because they have more participants in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 100 day plans. And also you communicate constantly, right? And then moving on, after 100 days, what happened? Then you execute the plan. You need to have a clear um, sort of project tracking who's responsible for what. Um, I just wanna, don't want to scare you, but um, in GE, we have an Excel, which I, I just saw it and I was shocked. You know, through the, the seven decades, we have 1,800 lines of Excel of checking list. Um, for across 27 enterprise processes and you know responsible by all the functions in the in, in the company so that we can we can ensure the integration will succeed um, and and we had um, a, a software tracking all of them and have ownership so we have a review so that's the next two years is a journey that we need to to make make sure that happen so 
I give you so much on, on the details. So, you know, he, here's a few takeaways per se, nine things that I, I guess um, I can share. So number one, I talk about integration is not, um, it's not a, a discrete phase. So you need to uh, get the, the, the people involved since due diligence. So day one, it's important to get them, them involved. Second, second of all, integration is a full-time job. You just cannot have you know, people, CEO coming in, coming out, and then drive the, uh, the steering committee. You, you, you need to get a, you know, almost the most senior guy in the company you know, after CEO leading the integration full-time driving and, and capturing you know what's going on you know what hasn't been done and, and they have to communicate they have to deal with external um, press etc right and like later and thirdly is you know you, you we need to have um, a day one plan ready and as I said it has to be clear on day one what you want to talk about especially communication um, you know how we're going to talk to the vendors to the external customers um, things like that and then um, the fourth one is we need to hold the orientation between the team. Just like I said, the two companies together come as a team. In, in G language, you call mutual discovery. What's good in GE? What's good in the company? What to adapt? What to adopt? What to uh, retain? Retain means you, you keep the acquired uh, company uh, processes or something that you want to adopt the GE way or something that you have to adapt, right? So have a plan and, and, and have a time really clear. For, uh, fifth one is um, you need to, to uh, involve the company that we acquired into one team so that they feel like they, they're part of the uh, integration and, and part of the new company. And six is we need to address the cultural differences head on. And this by, by, by saying this mean you, ne you need to have a clear Q&A questions, uh, a, a, a team building activities, a focus group, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and then get that feedback and, and, and feed into the management how we're going to do that, right? And seven, um, don't create uncertainty. Like I said, if you are clear what you want to do, think that non-negotiable on, for example, what email account and name we're going to use, what brand we're going to use on certain product, um, what management um, com um, members we have to let go or, or the, the certain company we, we want to retain. Be clear on day one. Be very clear because um, people don't want to live in, in uncertainty and it was going to drag down productivity and innovation of, of the, the quiet company, right? And, and last one, you, and, and the eighth one before last one, is structure with respect. Um, you know, we, 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 we are human, right? We, we need to, uh, to take care of them when, when we, uh, we ask them to, to leave the company. So treat them with dignity. And last one is communication, communication, communication. Make sure that whatever you do, share your vision and, um, and things that you want to achieve as a new company and get your, your new employees focused on that. So that's, those are the nine things that, that um, we, we believe that uh, it, it could work well with you and, and as, as much as work well with us. Hmm. Can, can I ask a question? Could you on how, how flexible are you? when you do these acquisition? If, for example, I mean, we know in Thailand, I don't know, do you do a lot of acquisitions in Thailand? Yeah, but, you know, part of our acquisition is like, we know in Thailand people, uh, companies keep two books, two accounting books, yeah. right? <laughs> so how, how flexible are you when you want to do an acquisition <laughs> on, on, on this, as far as this yeah. content? Because we, I mean, if we see the potential, we're not worried about the second book. You know, we, we're not worried about the official and non-official book because we want to take over the company, we'll fix it up, we'll clean it up, you know, and we'll go for it. But I'm interested to know, like a big company like yours with 1,800 questions, 100 day plan, <laughs> how flexible are you when it comes to things like that? Well, good question. I, the perspective I, I can give here is, number one is, when we acquired a company, right, Right, the, big value, the book value, you run the financial, you're going to you know, apply the multiple, you sure. see the value of the company, right? The way GE value the company is, yes, that's the first, that's the starting step. But when you put it um, with GE, you know, the combined enterprise, what's the value of this? I mean, that's, that's something that, that's in the deal that we put so that we, uh, we understand, you know, in the end, what kind of value we want to extract. Right. Do you consider intangible values? Yes.
a future cross sell, you know, leverage the brand distribution, we can cross sell certain product through that distribution channel. Sure. Things like that. Because I mean yeah. intangible plays a big role. I mean the last the last deal that we did, the intangible value is as much as the book value. And the owner will not sell it mm. if if you don't pay the price. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter uh, the multiple or not, this is what I want. You want it, you take it. <laughs> you know? So, and, and I'm interested to know when these big companies come in, yeah. how flexible are you in, in, into when you have funny owners like that or yeah. funny companies and with <laughs> these things? And, and, and maybe it actually comes back to one of the things that you were saying, Quinn Porchai, which is very often it's important and you advise a lot of your clients not to go through MA. Mm. <laughs> so, there's, there are two s aspects to it, which yeah. is obviously you want to get the deal done. You think about the strategic intent, what makes sense from a, for, you know, for yeah. from a leveraging synergies and so forth, and what you can do ultimately with a company. But very often it doesn't work. So I'm I'm curious to think through and for us to tell you, as Shai, in what cases doesn't it make sense? What are the sort of red flags that you typically see that that lead you to say and to work with your clients or your partners to say, don't do it. Okay, uh, I think well. In, in most market in, um, in ASEAN, um, I mean, the, the key usual red flags are, um, I think I, I talked about um, be clear about what you want to extract. This clarity can only be confirmed through properly executed due diligence. Now, I also mentioned focus. Um, a lot of people, when they, especially the acquirer, they get excited about an opportunity to penetrate new market, uh, gain an access to the new platform, um, the local talents, and so on and so forth. Um, what they often uh, have neglected is the proper due diligence, and they didn't spend enough time. People want to, to sign the MOU and get the deal done and send SPA within the next 45 days. In real life, it doesn't work that way, and it shouldn't work that way. Um, I, I did, um, I did talk about uh, talking clients out of doing M and A. I also have talked clients into doing certain deals, um, uh, which I won't name, but um, they didn't want to pay that extra five percent of the price um, for a number of reasons. And this happened about eight years ago. And then three years later, um, that asset became available again, and they went for it. They paid double of what they originally had to pay. Um, now, the red flags is always about pricing. Pricing people, clarity of what you want. Mm -hmm. um, if you are operating in, in a market where you have no control, uh, and this could be through um, uh, public opinion, regulatory control, um, uh, supply risk, um, logistics, uh, network, and most importantly, relationships. Um, I think Nadim talk, talked about, um, uh, you know, sometimes you go in and, and acquire a company, you don't want to be doing PR on day one that this company has a new owner <laughs> because you could be losing all your all your logistic network the next day. Uh, the, the, the people that used to do business with that company uh, may not want to be doing business with you. Um, so be clear about all these things. Um, yep. These are the red flags. Now, I talked about uh, the first question always is, can you afford it? Do you have, do you have the right people? Um, do you have the right resources? Mm. Can you afford the focus? And I will say this again, can you afford for it to fail? Um, what would that do to the mother company? So those are the things that I usually talk to clients about first. Mm. One of the things which come across in what you're saying and which is relatively striking is how ultimately different types of capabilities are needed to go through the m a process. So some of the things which are mentioned are on one side vision. You need the vision to know that you want something. I think Nadem, you mentioned that quite a bit. Um, but then Quinn Porchai, you're mentioning due diligence. It's actually the opposite, keeping a cold head during due diligence and making sure that, yes, there is a vision, 
but you, uh, the entity, the organization, the individuals effectively keep their heads on their shoulders to make sure that the due diligence process is the right one, you're not forcing an acquisition. That requires a different set of capabilities and different sort of cap in a way. Third one is around integration. Integration, again, we're talking about both softer skills in a way um, around, you mentioned leadership, respect, um, but also 1,800 lines of, of Excel to make sure that the processes are, are in place, which are very different capabilities. The last question I would have maybe before, um, before we open it to the floor is, ultimately, what types of individuals will be successful in, in, in M&A? It does require very, very different skills, uh, both being sort of visionary, but being detail-oriented, both seeing the big picture from a strategic standpoint but being detailed enough to think through the implications of what you're doing after integration. Uh, we've talked to quite a bit about the cultural aspects as well. So thinking through cultural aspects, being open-minded enough to, in some cases, have three headquarters around the world, look, uh, keep local management teams, even if you are a very big international companies based out of China. So it requires lots of different skills. So we'd love to have your thinking on, when you think, or your thoughts on what sort of individuals can effectively do that or what sort of teams are effectively needed to do that because it probably requires a little bit of different types of, uh, different types of individuals. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to say like, I'm glad I'm not part of a giant company because <laughs> you know, with all their procedures, I think it makes it more difficult uh, than a smaller company. Yep. Uh, but for us is, uh, you know, we have to have um, a very open mind uh, based on our objectives. And there has to be some flexibility uh, when you are dealing uh, with, uh, with an acquisition. I mean, obviously, you're doing something because you want to add value to your, uh, to your company. And you're taking over a company that have a lot of problems. And you know, with problems, is like people are not motivated, uh, the, maybe all the procedures are not in line, uh, you know, a lot of things are missing. I mean, we've seen it all the time. I mean, I've done three, three acquisition and I've seen it in every, every case, uh, even the latest one. I mean, uh, a lot of things they don't do the way we are doing it. So we got to be flexible. We got to be, I think these gentlemen mentioned it as well. You got to work with the team. You got to make them feel that you're part of as one. Uh, but yes, there's a lot of flexibility. We don't have 1,800 questions. We don't have a plan for 100 day because a 100 day plan would take 150 days because we know there are a lot of problems and issues that we need to work around. So we gotta, we gotta go with the pace based on how their capabilities are. You know, that's, that's I mean, as a smaller mm -hmm. company, we have, I, I guess we have more flexibility than a bigger company. So it makes it easier for us. I, my perspective is, it's, you know, gee, such a, doing this so, so many times and, it just takes a lot of people. It's a big team. You know, first of all, the business development team, they do not think about looking for deals, you know, hang out with investment bankers and, and, um, and find the, uh, the company that, find the target companies. So, and they pitch the deal day in and day out, right? So every month we have a board that review the deals and, and you know, funnel down with deals they want to go to, which, you know, just go on on strategic fits and things like that. Then I think the key person for us is integration leader. Once things, we sign a deal um, and we sort of uh, find a leader just before the deal close, probably a, a month or so before the deal close, that person, it has to be a super leader um, in, in my view. Whether to solve the hard skills and be able to deal with the press, deal with the regulator, the pressure on employees and, and things that doesn't fall in place and drive the project management, you know, in, 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 a, in a large scale of integration. So that's, to me, that's, that's for, for G's perspective. Other perspective before we open to the floor for questions? Maybe. Okay, sure. all right. Uh, for Lenovo itself, uh, I think most of the, the m and deal or J videos, uh, normally we have to deal with two parties. Uh, one is customers and one is employees. So we have to define you know, how we can keep the key talents, and then we, how we can make people have uh, feel that no difference between the new owner and the uh, previous owner, so that they can feel comfortable with uh, and stay with us. 
And then for the uh, customers, uh, we need to make sure that same thing, you know, uh, they don't want to feel different. They don't want to guess whether you can deliver what the previous company can deliver. Uh, uh, is there any big impact for their business uh, when uh, we change the owner? And then uh, the last one is the, uh, the for the company. Uh, we have to make sure that you know every M and A or J J J videos, um, you know, company get the uh, competitive advantage. You know, it's not like you know we just buy it for fun or we want to uh, increase our stock price. You know, but uh, we have to make sure that every single deal is the profitable deal, no matter it's short term or long term. And then the company and employees, uh, they can share the, uh, the wealth together. Great. In terms of process, what I suggest we do is uh, we open for Q&A in the room. Uh, very lively discussion. I'm sure that there will be questions arising in the room. Uh, uh, obviously, sort of feel free. Uh, I know a microphone can be circulated around as well for any questions that you have. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, we, we're just bringing a microphone. So that, yeah. Hi. It's on. Okay. Um, I have um, uh, two questions for the panel. First, you talk a lot about um, big companies and even um, the medium one. But um, in ASEAN, there are many small companies, and I'm sure this would be where a lot of m and should happen because in order for them to grow forward and to integrate into the the many countries and um, in the region, they need to stick together and they, they need to combine their resources and their talents to to go to move forward. So, in in this respect, what what should they be doing? I mean, they don't have the money to to hire like a hundred lawyers or you know like B and D team, and there, there's just a couple of people around. And they they need to make this kind of decision. So what should they do? I mean, what would be the, the thing that should be going through their mind? Um, the second question is also, um, in ASEAN culture, I, I believe in many, in many of the ASEAN culture here, the ownership is very strong. It's more personal than business. It's unlike in Europe. So they, you don't think about the number. This is more about the heart. So how do you convince a person to sell, even though it might be a, a better option so, so, can you share some light um, on these two aspects, if if possible? Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I take the second one. But the guys the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's difficult if you don't have money, <laughs> as a small company, and you want to develop. Uh, you you got to have this good relationship with the bankers here, you know. So, I think this is a good opportunity to talk together <laughs> after, <laughs> you know. But uh, you know, definitely the support of the banks are very important because they, uh, actually bankers, we, we have this great relationship. And, and remember, SST is a, it was a small company uh, before they acquired us. But because of their good relationship with the banks uh, and they wanted to develop and grow very strong, uh, actually it's the bank who recommended it. And the bank, I mean, they do have credibility. You don't have credibility in the market, forget it. Might as well sell and become part of a bigger company and then later on plan on doing acquisitions in the future. But the relationship with the bank is very important and the support of the bank is very important. Credibility is very important. So as a small company, you, you really knew the, you, <coughs> you do need uh, these attributes to be able to, to do an acquisition or, uh, you know, find, I mean, start small. And that's what I, what, what I would do. Uh, um, how to convince this is, is interesting. I mean, look, when we, in the last bidding, we were uh, bidding with uh, all the giants, all the big companies in town. And we, we, we said we may not win. As far as finance is concerned, I think these guys can offer better than us. We were dealing against private equities, international private equities, big giants in the food business in Thailand. So we, we didn't think we would have a chance. But these guys talk a lot about finance. That's, that's what I mean here. Like big companies, they have procedures. They don't have too much flexibility. They do their due diligence. They are very strict about them. And this can be an advantage to a smaller company. Because once you understand the owner or the founder, when, as we understood the founder of the company, we understood 
he's very much artistic. He's an innovator. Now, he doesn't like figures. You come and talk to him about figures, you know, he's, he's like, okay, you know, that's fine. But if you are able to capture his heart when it comes to innovation, artistic and things like that, so you understand where his weaknesses are, that's where we were able to convince him. He was convinced, we didn't win the bidding the first time. Then they came back to us after two months because they said, all these guys talk about these guys who won the winning, the bidding. They all, all what they talk about is, up, is about figures and finance. It's, it's giving us headaches. We don't want to work with them. So please come back. So we went back and we talked to them again. And so they need to have a partner that understands them, that understands their ultimate objectives for the future, and, 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 and bring in some romance into this deal. And that's how we got the deal. You know, that's how we got the deal. So that, that's my version. <laughs> <laughs> the first question I, I, I cannot ask you, I, I don't have experience in, in doing it with our money and uh, enough resources because we have a lot of resources. <laughs> so <laughs> the second question is interesting and uh, I, I can share a few deals but I cannot mention names. Um, first of all, focus on the company strength. You know, GE is not everything, but GE have certain strength that we can leverage. A global player, uh, a, be the legacy from Jack Welch Day, and things like that are people know, and, and you, you kind of position yourself first like that. And second of all, you, you look at the acquired company, what are they bringing to the table, and cherish that. So y once you start off with that, the conversation getting getting better, right? Then, like like um, like this gentleman said. You know, it's, it's sort of like a courtship. You know, a lot of deals happen over the course of five years. From the first day of entry, you talk, you talk, the owners change their mind, they think that they like the other more than the others. You know, you, you kind of leverage that strength and talk about it, right? Once you get into the, okay, I'm start liking you now, then you go into the phase where you can do a, a shareholder agreement where let's do this for three years or five years. If this works out, I'll buy you more. If it doesn't work out, I'll sell you at this price. Things like that. I think it's kind of alleviate the uh, the feeling of you know I'm so attached to this company. You know what I'm gonna do it for my son and my. This thing can be structured over a period of time, but you need to have a chemical first and then start talking. But focus on the future of of, of the company is just just what we we think. But but you gotta bring some strength to the table. I mean, why why should he work with you? I mean, mm -hmm. what. What can you bring, what value can you bring to add to the company? Yeah. Our, our value was because we are experienced franchisees, we are able to take the brand international, we have a lot of networking in the international market, so that's why, that's where the, it clicked. Um, I think bu building on to, um, to um, what they were saying earlier, um, how do you convince the, the owner? Um, actually, you don't have to. Um, a lot of time you, you, you give them good ideas and you leave them with it. Um, sometimes it takes six months, um, sometimes it takes six, six years. years. <laughs> um, um, but I, I'm, I'm not advising that, that we do that all the time. It's sometimes you've got to gotta keep, pe keep people time. Um, uh, the stage of their thinking changes. Mm. Um, uh, you can talk about you know the benefits um, of having the other party in. You can talk about how you structure the deal to make it workable. You can talk about that all day. Um, in the end, before you 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 talk about uh, uh, being together with someone or or merging the business or even a small JV, um, maybe you can even start with something small, small like. Um, doing logistics together, um, getting more comfortable with each other. Um, advisors or banks, um, sometimes they have a role, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times I, I told potential clients that look, you don't need banks to do all this, you can do it yourself. <laughs> it's actually better if it comes from you. A lot of times we... we I we see your boss sitting in the back <laughs> over there. <Yeah. laughs> I've checked, he's not here. Um, but it is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of times, I mean, you were asking earlier about what makes it uh, successful. Honesty. Um, people do see right through you. 
if you uh, if you making things up. And once you lost that trust, that six months that I was talking about becomes six years. So um, be clear about that first. Um, on this first question, um, I think there are many banks that uh, be that that are willing to work with um, uh, smaller or medium-sized enterprises um, to talk about M and A's, to to bring them together, um, and to provide uh, even balance sheet support. But it has to make sense first. You always go back to 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 what we were saying earlier. You got to be clear about what you you want out of this. You don't actually have to pay them large fees all the time. It's it's always about sometimes benefit sharing. A lot of banks now these days, they don't, they don't do this M&A thing um, just because they would get a, a, a fat check out of the advisory fee or, or a large lending deals. A lot of times I've seen banks that have their own private equity. Um, they'll be willing to get paid in terms of future benefits. So be flexible yeah. um, uh, is also key. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Kosit. I'm running a small uh, business consulting firm now, but I used to uh, get involved with the uh, international and local uh, merging and acquisitions over the last uh, few decades. Right, I got two uh, questions, but they both related to the uh, uh, change in ASEAN business uh, practices as well. As we all know, ASEAN is, uh, is a group of emerging market which is own uh, unique in a way. I think M&A is obviously predictable, all right? Many more in a different fashion, not like in Europe or in the US. Uh, simply because of several factors, but two most uh, factors that I see is, is the more participation of SMEs in uh, Southeast Asia, and also the introduction of sustainable development concepts over the last uh, five, six years, you know, much stronger now. Now the first question, in fact, he asked it before, but <laughs> I'd like to elaborate more about it, is that uh, because of these small SMEs in, in ASEAN would like to, uh, to get involved in this you know, opportunity, however, because of uh, lack of funds. Now the other concept that introduced in the market recently is about the crowdfunding. Now because especially you in CIMB and also from uh, GE Capitals, you know, this, this introduction of crowdfunding, do you think it will change the M&A market in ASEAN? That's my first question. Second question is about this, uh, this S-curve. You know, none of you mentioned about this S-curve. Basically, is the CapEx. It's the investment of all technologies, of all the business at the beginning. Over the years, big corporations worldwide invest a lot in S-curve and see that opportunity to maximize the value through M&As, which is the shortcut that Lenovo introduced that idea. Uh, however, because of the sustainable development concept and also the introduction of the social enterprise concept over the last few years, more and more popular. It can be the other way around. You know, it's not the big corporation would go for M&A because you already enjoy the S-curve in the investment, would like to enjoy by doing a shortcut M&A to enjoy the maximum benefit, you know, when it's above the water. But now it's the other way around. Do you think the big corporation would come up with the different ideas and technology in the future to turn the S-curve around? Basically, you invest for SME to become part of your M&A instead of acquiring them because you want to enjoy their investment. I, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and I thought my questions were long. Bank, um, <laughs> banker. <laughs> banker first. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, it's actually interesting you asked that. Um, and I, I mentioned that because bankers probably make the worst um, uh, private equity um, operator. Um, so as a bank, we realized that. Um, so what we did do was um, we have a group under, under actually our own internal M&A team. Um, they went out and set up various funds. Um, these, are not, these are not company that call CIMB Private Equity Limited um, because they wouldn't understand. Um, and what they wouldn't understand is, is, is 
how to work with SMEs, uh, the visions, what to pay, what not to pay, what to look at, what not to look at. Um, instead, they went out and, and, and create um, funds like Bangsa Capital that focuses on, on medium-sized companies already. There are uh, a number of funds that are being created right now. Uh, they were just here in Thailand a few weeks back that only want to focus on SME. So it's not, I, I think the, the, the PE space for, for, for the big boys are quite crowded already. So um, people are now um, focusing and paying more attention to the, the S size uh, and the M size of type of um, corporations. So you will be seeing more and more of these type of funds that will be willing to take views on um, smaller companies getting together, um, needing initial capital, and, and be willing to take a higher risk. So that's the question to your first one. Um, I think that takes one minute. OK, um, I, I add what, uh, what she's doing. Um, yes, we, we, we having that program. We call it investment pool or the, uh, the other program called localization. I'll give you a few example, right? First one is um, we don't have a good gasification technology, basically take the wood chips, taking the, the napier glass, whatever, right, to, to make it to become a gas and then burn it to produce electricity. But we have a great gas engines, Genbaka and, and Waukesha. So we fund university to do a research on Napier gas so that it, when it feeds to the gasifier uh, machine, it, 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 it burns and, and you know, work with our machine. So we don't have quite that small company that doing the gasifier, but we, ha we fund them to do a research. And then we do agreement that if, if they, it works, if you can sell gasifier, maybe you, uh, you bundle with our gas engines. Say for example, um, so that's, that's one of the things that we do. And also we, we, um, we fund um, a program where a customer want to do a more efficient, you know, like a sustainable development, more efficient, you know, less uh, emission um, gas turbine, but uh, you know, we have technology, but they, they, they need some funding and they, they need a launch product because we, we never, never have a proven um, commercially somewhere. So we're willing to put our own equity for the first year and then have it launch and run for the first year. If it run as we expected, we sold it off. So that's, that's the model we're looking for as well. We, we're not buying the, the company that uh, M&A per se, but we also invest in, in those companies. Okay. Very, very, <coughs> very quickly to answer the second question, I cannot answer the first one, but for the second one, you were talking about these big giant companies sitting with big assets. Well, it's definitely, I mean, some of them are struggling, especially like in Europe, North Europe, I mean, in Europe and in uh, Middle East. But I think there's a lot of opportunities there in Asia because Asia is the place now. Asia is booming. A lot of things are happening. So, and what do they hold these big companies with all their assets? They have technology, they have information, which is valuable for the ASEAN countries. So there could be a shift. I mean, I'm sure they want a piece of the action where they are. They want a piece of the action. They have the assets, they have the technology, they have uh, you know, all this information, but they are struggling. So some of them may go into different segments, but I'm sure some of them will want to come and do business here in Asia, in ASEAN, or in company in ASEAN will be interested to know what is happening over there to do some merger and acquisitions. Now that's my thoughts. Thank you. So we, we've spent an hour and a half on this panel. Thank you so much for, for attending today. It's been, it's been an interesting conversation. We've talked about Excel spreadsheets. We've talked about courtship. We've talked about romance. So uh, a relatively sort of very wide discussion. So thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists for, uh, for this presence today. And thank you.